from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello, my name is Alyssa Carroll, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous, vile, and disturbing behaviors. Special thanks to some of my patrons, Pixie, Rachel, Whitney, Maya, Alethea, Elena, Aaron, Katoras, Catherine, Sam, Linda, Katarina, Teresa, Sophie, Nanette, Emma, Emily, Galen, Bree, David, John, and Judy. Thank you so much, guys. You are truly appreciated. And for anyone else, please feel free to join my patrons so that I can bring you more of what you crave. Also, like, share, and subscribe. It might just help our little community grow. Today's podcast will be on Earl Nelson. Earl Leonard Farrell was born on May 12, 1897 in San Francisco, California. And since there was so much going on in and around San Francisco area kind of during his time, the history portion is just for that area. Starting with his hometown, San Francisco, and really California as a whole, was mostly settled by European Americans until the gold rush that started around 1849. After that, words cannot describe how fast that area became the largest population and most important commercial, naval, and financial place in the American West. Due to the gold rush, there was a large movement for law enforcement in that area due to vigilantes and the, quote, red light district of Barbary Coast, gambling, prostitution, and more. But during the 1860s and for the next 20 years or so, San Francisco began transforming itself into an impressive major city. Construction and building began to expand at an incredible rate, and the more famous neighborhoods began to take shape, such as Western Edition, Eureka Valley, Mission District, and two more famous areas, Haight-Ashbury and Golden State Park, which was built in 1887. San Francisco's famous cable cars were built around this time in order to help navigate the very steep hills as well as connecting all of the neighborhoods. The San Francisco Stock and Bond Exchange was founded in 1882. With that much growth, so fast comes corrupt politics. The mayor in 1896 pushed for reform, raised funds through bonds, and was able to construct a new sewer system, 17 new schools, two parks, another state-of-the-art hospital, and a main library. After him, some people referred to San Francisco as the modern Paris of the West. And as though this might sound familiar, let's talk about the bubonic plague that happened in San Francisco. What is now referred to as the third plague pandemic started in 1855 in China and spread to India with the most deaths. In 1894, it hit Hong Kong, which was a major trade port between China and the United States. The news of this spread quickly and U.S. officials were scared that it would be brought to the country from cargo ships coming from the Pacific Ocean. So... At first, the ships were thoroughly inspected. It is important to note that they did not realize that the fleas on the rats aboard the ships were the carriers and that those fleas would be biting the humans. The rats carried the disease as well. So when the ships were cleared to come to the dock, people that got off the boats looked healthy at first. Needless to say, it didn't take long for people to get sick. 
Some top officials refused to say that there was a plague in San Francisco. It started with Asian immigrants dying, and it would be reported that they died from pneumonia or lung edema. The new U.S. territory of Hawaii, namely Honolulu, was hit hard by the plague in 1899, and people were dying quickly. This city decided to burn houses that had had infected people in them. So for four months, people were evacuated and quarantined. But in 1900, the wind changed its course and nearly all of the Chinatown area was burned, totaling 38 acres and leaving thousands homeless. People were being found dead in the boats out in the San Francisco Bay, and autopsies showed they had died from the plague. They even released an article in the San Francisco Examiner called, quote, Why San Francisco is Plague Proof, end quote. Some experts claimed that it was the rice-based diet of the Asians that had lowered their resistance to the plague and that the fact that most of the European-descended citizens would be fine because their diet contained more meat. So this was the atmosphere that Earl was born into. His mother was Frances Nelson. His father was James Farrell. It was said that when Earl was an infant, there was a vacancy in his eyes, though this was said after he was already grown and most likely heavily biased. So Earl was born into an already less than ideal situation. His very young mother, Frances, died from syphilis when Earl was only nine months old. She had contracted the venereal disease from Earl's father, James, who also died from syphilis when Earl was just barely over a year old. He was sent to live with his maternal grandmother, 44-year-old Jenny Nelson, who was at that point a widow. She was still raising her own two remaining children, 12-year-old Willis and 10-year-old Lillian. To say Jenny Nelson was fanatically religious still doesn't truly capture how intense she was. And she instilled her fanatical beliefs into her children and now her grandson. She spent hours and hours reading the Bible to the children and Earl picked up a particular passion for its passages, especially for the Book of Revelations. Lucky for Earl, his grandmother was utterly devoted to him, so much so that she was blind to the fact that there was something about him that was off from day one. He displayed a mania that was well beyond a normal childhood hyperactivity, but would then seem to be crushed under the weight of melancholy, often spending days in his room. At times, while his grandmother and young aunt were milling about in the kitchen, Earl would sit in a chair and just stare out into space for hours. At other times, he would walk around the house with his head tilted, as if listening to voices that were not there. Though his grandmother laundered his clothes nicely, bathed him regularly, Earl would leave the house and come back completely filthy and sometimes even wearing someone else's clothes that appeared to be from some homeless child or out of someone's trash. And if his odd hygiene behaviors weren't enough, he also began showing very strange eating habits as well. Young Earl took to pouring a large amount of olive oil over his food, then leaning his face to his plate and loudly slurping up his dinner, much to the disgust of the others. His uncle and aunt started calling him the wild man of Borneo. Of course, their constant teasing of him did nothing to help his self-esteem. He would, from the time he was old enough to talk, say that he was worthless. He said, quote, I am not good for anything. I will never be good for anything. Nobody wants me. I would be better off out of this world." End quote. When Earl was seven years old, his teachers at school raised concerns about the fact that the little boy began talking to invisible people and often quoted directly from the Bible about the quote, great beast. 
He was expelled from school for having random outbursts of rage and taking it out on both the other boys and girls. Also around this age, Earl began peeping at his cousin Rachel as she undressed. Then, when young Earl was nine years old, San Francisco was hit by an 8.25 magnitude earthquake. It shook buildings down to the ground, buckled the streets, and busted nearly all of the water lines within the city. All of this in one minute's time. The fire that followed burned 500 city blocks. To Earl, it was as if the end times were coming, that God was punishing the city as he had Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible. After the earthquake, armed looters were running around the city, holding women up at gunpoint. Earl's grandmother and aunt would sit and talk about it, exchanging worried glances at each other. Earl found their fear entertaining. So at 10 years old, already having a well-established reputation for unacceptable behavior, he decided to go for a ride on his bike on some trolley tracks and he was hit by one of the trolleys, causing a serious head injury around his temple from which he bled profusely. The doctor cleaned him up and said he'd be just fine, but he wasn't fine. He was in fact in a coma for several days. During that time, his grandmother read scripture to him, but by some miracle, Earl survived the ordeal. The injury affected him in many ways after though. He suffered from short-term memory loss, stated he had frequent and intense headaches, and began displaying even more troublesome behavior. His Aunt Lillian, being only 10 years older than him, was always affectionate toward Earl and cared for him with a sort of sisterly love. In 1908, a year after Earl's trolley accident, his grandmother died of what though I couldn't find. She would have been in her mid fifties. His Aunt Lillian, by then grown and married herself, welcomed Earl into her home. She believed he had the mind of a child and knew, though he was so strange, that he was family and she dedicated herself to taking care of him. When Earl Nelson was 14 years old, he decided to drop out of school. He proceeded to work an innumerable amount of odd jobs in quick succession. Most of the time, he would only work a job for a couple of days, but there were times where he worked somewhere for a few weeks. The issue was that his boss would tell him to do something, leave, and return after some time to find Earl standing in the exact same place, staring at the sky with a look of bewilderment on his face. Other times, he would be working diligently, then act like he was hearing someone speak, he would open his hands and release his tools to hit the floor or ground and walk off following what he heard. Earl had developed a reputation for coming home to Lillian's house, sitting down at the table for dinner, and when she had guests, he would sporadically begin shouting explicatives, which would embarrass her greatly. Sometimes he would just sit there and stare at her female guests and it made them so uncomfortable they would excuse themselves and leave. Other times, Earl would wander off and not come home for days. Still, even with his increasingly bizarre behavior, Lillian felt sorry for the teen Earl. She saw that he had no friends and was most likely never to find a mate or be able to fully take care of himself. And when Earl was seen with another kid, they were always noticeably younger than he. When he wasn't obsessively reading through his Bible, he loved reading books about detectives and gossip columns, but he especially loved books about the occult, including astrology and reading palms but he was also becoming obsessed with something darker that he didn't let anyone else see. It was stated that he pleasured himself nearly constantly, but it became less effective at curbing his sex addiction. At the age of 15, he began visiting brothels. 
He also began drinking alcohol in excess. By the age of 17, his behavior had become so bizarre and borderline aggressive, Lillian, who now had two growing children of her own, started to become a little bit scared of Earl. He began to drink more and more. But at the same time, what money Earl earned from his jobs that he didn't squander on booze and prostitutes, he did bring home to Lillian to help contribute to his keep. So, that was Earl Nelson's childhood. I'm sure there is very little doubt as to what's going on with him. From early on, he experienced hallucinations and paranoid delusions. Dr. William Pritchard evaluated Earl Nelson back during an early stint in jail and stated, quote, he has seen faces, heard music, and at times believed people were poisoning him. Voices sometimes whisper to him to kill himself. Says that if he were kept in jail, he would get something sharp and cut the veins in his wrists, end quote. Dr. Pritchard also said that he experienced occipital headaches, which are experienced in the back of the head, fainted several times while in jail, and would often feel dizzy. The records from back then only say he was diagnosed as, quote, mentally insane. But we can look at his symptoms and get a pretty good idea that he suffered from psychosis. So, did he have childhood schizophrenia? Well, let's look. According to the mayoclinic.org, childhood schizophrenia is an uncommon but severe mental disorder in which children interpret reality abnormally. Schizophrenia involves a range of problems with thinking or cognition, behavior or emotions. It can result in hallucinations, delusions, and extremely disordered thinking and behavior that impairs the child's ability to function. Schizophrenia is most known to begin affecting the person from sometime in their teens until their mid-twenties, but it isn't unheard of for children to develop. When it occurs this early in life, it has a profound impact on a child's behavior and development. The early onset presents special challenges for diagnosis, treatment, education, and emotional and social development. It is a chronic condition that will require lifelong treatment. Recognizing and getting the diagnosis as early as possible significantly helps the child's long-term outcome. So back in the early 1900s, how did they help recognize, diagnose, and handle someone who was, at least in my opinion, living with schizophrenia? Back then, psychology was just beginning to recognize schizophrenia as its own thing and distinguish it from other forms of psychosis. Treatment back then was basically trial and error, and many of the methods had horrid side effects. Doctors performed brain surgery and used electric shock therapy. The patients who displayed the most disturbed, socially unacceptable behaviors were given large doses of sedative drugs and were confined most of the time. Most people like Earl would have been put into an asylum back then. In 1910, Winston Churchill wrote to the prime minister at that time saying that there should be a, quote, mass sterilization of people with severe mental illness. End quote. He went on to say that the, quote, feeble-minded and insane classes constitute a danger which is impossible to exaggerate and that the source from which the stream of madness is fed should be cut off and sealed up before another year has passed. End quote. Ouch. Most diagnosed schizophrenics are a much greater danger to themselves than anyone else. But I think Earl, if he indeed lived with schizophrenia, was the exception. There have been some that suggest the propensity for developing schizophrenia is increased when other family members also live with specific mental illnesses. One study boldly stated that as many as four out of five cases of schizophrenia can be traced back to genes inherited from the child's parents. 
There is some evidence to show that male children are slightly more likely to develop schizophrenia as opposed to females, but by adolescence, it affects males and females pretty much equally. Now, this is an old true crime case back when things weren't understood nearly as clearly as they are now. Also, in my research, I found no real information about Earl Nelson's birth mother and father. We do know his mother was young and his father was of Spanish descent and they both died from syphilis. I couldn't find any evidence that exposure to syphilis to a fetus affects the mental health of the baby specifically. In nearly all cases, the baby generally dies before or during childbirth. If they do survive, there are usually obvious physical signs of abnormal bone growth and so on. So I'll go out on a limb and say that I don't believe he was exposed to it while his mother was pregnant with him. It was, in my limited reach as far as research goes, difficult to find out if there were any family history of mental illness with regards to Earl. We know his grandmother was a religious fanatic and there could be something there. But to be completely honest, there's just not enough information out there about his family that would help paint a clearer picture. Setting aside his mental health issues, both of his parents died, but he was not even two years old when he went to go live with his mother's mother. His grandmother and her two remaining children who were still living at home then. He was loved and cared for, doted on, and I found no instance where anyone abused him, mentally, physically, or sexually. Earl was already displaying very troubling behaviors before his head injury, but any head injury, especially one that results in the person being in a coma, is cause for review. It was said that his head injury, including blood loss, was to his temple. Behind the skin of the temple is where four skull bones fuse together, the frontal, parietal, temporal, and sphenoid bones. Behind that is our temporal lobe, and that is responsible for primary auditory perception, such as hearing, and it helps process sounds as speech and words for comprehension. Damage to this area could also possibly cause failure to recognize faces or have overall disorders of visual perception. The injured person could have a much harder time understanding someone when they are speaking. There could be impaired long-term or short-term memory. Also, temporal lobe damage could cause someone's personality to alter and thus affect their behavior, including an increase in aggressive behavior, irritability, and increased anger, and altered sexual behavior. We do see these behaviors in Earl as well. Either way, no matter what mental illness he was living with, we know it was quite severe and it affected his everyday life greatly and he was not receiving any kind of help or treatment. So Earl began to do petty crimes and in 1915, at 18 years old, he broke into a cabin out in the country that he thought had been abandoned. He found some valuables, but before he left, the owner returned home. Earl ran out of the house into the forest, but was caught. His Aunt Lillian received the telegraph that Earl had been arrested. At his trial, she testified in his defense, stating he was, quote, a poor, unfortunate boy, orphaned when just a baby. He was found guilty and sentenced to two years in San Quentin State Prison. He was actually released the next year in 1916, but was arrested again in March 1917 for petty larceny, to which he was sentenced to another six months. Once released, he migrated toward Los Angeles and was soon arrested for burglary. After five months in the Los Angeles jail, he escaped. It is important to note that World War I had already started and everyone, including Earl, was feeling patriotic. After his escape from prison, Earl decided he would join the army and enlisted under his actual last name, Farrell, and was sent to Northern California for training. 
While American troops were fighting in the war, getting gravely injured in every way imaginable, Earl was still training, didn't like the fact that he had been assigned to be an overnight guard. It was cold and he was uncomfortable, so he went AWOL. He immediately decided to join the Navy and enlisted as a cook, but his chores proved more than he could bear, so he deserted. Then Earl enlisted with the medical corps, but deserted it yet again because, as he stated later, he had hemorrhoids that were bothering him greatly. In 1918, he was back in the Navy, but he refused to do any work, preferring to sit and read the Bible constantly. He was reprimanded, but it did nothing to improve his attitude or behavior. Finally, after complaining of intense headaches, he was sent to Mare Island Naval Hospital. While there, he was evaluated and sent to the Napa State Mental Hospital on May 21st, 1918, when he was 21 years old. Now, according to the book Bestial by Harold Schechter, Earl's doctor recommended he be sent to the mental hospital because Earl, quote, continually reads his testament or gazes fixedly into space, answers questions slowly, takes no interest in what is going on around him, shows some mental deterioration. He refuses to work and his reason for not working is that he did not want to serve the adversaries of the Lord. He believed the beast spoken of in Revelation as being number 666 is either the Pope or the Kaiser. He does not think he is crazy, end quote. The doctor's diagnosis was constitutional psychopathic state. They ran some blood work and found that he tested positive for syphilis and gonorrhea from his days of visiting the brothels. Earl assured the doctors that his childhood had been pleasant, that he was happy, and that his mind was all right. He stated he was going to make his way in the world. He did his best to convince the doctors that he was not experiencing hallucinations, both auditory or visual. They gave him intelligence tests and he passed them as an average person would. In May 1919, Earl escaped from the mental hospital, but by then World War I was over and the Navy was no longer going to pay for his medical bills. He was discharged and not pursued. He went back to living with his Aunt Lillian and got a job as a custodian at St. Mary's Hospital. While working there, Earl developed a crush on a maternity ward cleaning lady. Mary was 58 years old, Earl just 22. She was flattered but surprised at the attention he gave her. She was what they called a spinster, which was a woman of a certain age that had never married. They quickly married on August 5th, 1919. They moved from one very small rented room to another. Now she realized quickly that he rarely ever bathed and was, for the most part, like an oversized child. Mary nearly immediately fell into the role of being Earl's mother for all intents and purposes. She would demand he bathe before visiting relatives, and in one instance, he took a glass of water, poured it over his bare feet, put his socks and shoes back on, and said his feet were clean, so they were ready to go. Needless to say, she was horrified by his behavior, both in private as well as out in society. She could not wrap her mind around his eating habits, and he was still leaving the house in clean clothes and returning in what appeared to be a hobo's outfit. Also around this time, Earl began to suffer from severe migraines that medication wouldn't even touch. Then, while at work one day, he fainted and fell from a rather high ladder, landing on his head and had to be in the hospital with a severe head wound. Once he was coherent enough, he just walked out of the hospital, bandage on his head and all. Soon, his auditory and visual hallucinations began to increase. After only being married for two years, Mary had had enough. Her brother, as well as co-workers she had befriended, all begged her to leave Earl before he became violent. And her decision was none too soon. 
when she told him she was not going to move yet again because of his paranoid delusions. He cornered her and acted like he was going to strangle her. She ran away and managed to escape. Earl showed up at her work and threatened her again, but once he knew the police were being called for, he left through an open window. This, apparently, was his breaking point. Not long after his wife left him, he presented himself as a plumber at a residence and was allowed inside. Twelve-year-old Mary Summers showed him to the basement. He grabbed her and started trying to molest her. She screamed, which got the attention of her older brother who came running to help her. Earl ran from the house but was captured later on a trolley. At a competency hearing, he was deemed dangerous and was sent back to the Napa State Mental Hospital and was discharged in 1925. He was then 28 years old. The next year, Earl Nelson entered a boarding house owned by a 60-year-old landlady named Clara Newman. Once inside, he strangled her and once she was dead, he raped her remains, then hid it in a vacant room in her house. Not even two weeks later, he knocked on the door of 63-year-old Laura Beale. Once inside, he strangled her with a cord so tightly it had literally dug into her flesh. In June 1926, Earl let himself into 63-year-old Lillian St. Mary's house where he strangled and raped her. He then traveled south to Santa Barbara and walked into the boarding house of 53-year-old Ollie Russell, where he also strangled her, then raped her remains. Two months later, in August, 52-year-old Mary Nisbet was visited by Earl Nelson. He strangled her to death and raped her corpse. Then he left her in the bathroom of the vacant apartment. Her husband found her later. He then began to travel outside of California into Oregon and Washington, leaving a trail of bodies treated in the same manner as the women in California. One pregnant woman managed to survive her attacker. Earl then traveled through the Midwest over to the East Coast, murdering women all along the way until he landed in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Two women disappeared in Winnipeg. Another had been murdered by being bludgeoned to death with a claw hammer. The next day, the police, knowing the victims had been looted of their wedding rings and clothing was missing from the house, decided to visit the local jeweler and a second-hand clothing store. Both owners positively identified Earl Nelson as the one who had sold them the wedding rings and the clothing. The barber that had a shop next to the clothing store said he had given a haircut to a man and had noticed he had dried blood on his scalp as well as scratch marks. The police began searching the boarding houses in the area and entered August Hill's home. She said that Earl had indeed been staying there. When they searched his room, they found the nude and mutilated body of another woman under his bed. It was clear that Earl had slept in the bed with the corpse just below him. The Canadian police sent the information they had to the U.S., knowing he was a U.S. citizen and would most likely return to his home country. On June 16, 1927, the police arrested a man that fit Earl's description in a Manitoba border that was going by the name of Virgil Wilson. They put him in the local jail and he promptly escaped, only to be caught again as he entered a train full of policemen. He was fingerprinted and they matched what was on file in San Francisco. So Earl fully admitted to his crimes. He stated, quote, I only do my lady killings on Saturday nights, end quote. Then soon after, he claimed to be innocent. Earl's trial started on November 1st, 1927 in Winnipeg's court building. Mary, Earl's ex-wife, testified against him, stating he was, quote, absolutely insane. 
There were also over 60 other people who came to testify seeing him near crime scenes or stating he had been in the area at the time. It took the jury less than an hour to reach a guilty verdict and the sentence was death. He was hanged on January 13, 1928. He was 31 years old. His final words were, quote, I forgive those who have wronged me, end quote. So I think we can all agree that Earl Nelson was most likely born to kill. I mean, he had no regard for his health, personal hygiene. He didn't grasp the idea of manners. He held conversations with people that did not exist. He idolized his grandmother who had raised him since he was two years old. He married a woman nearly old enough to be his grandmother, but she recognized fairly quickly that something was very wrong with him and she fled. Other than bouts of anger, he didn't really show any specific violent streaks until his wife left him. Personally, I feel that the love he had for his grandmother was absolute and due to his mental illness, he most likely combined that love and twisted it with his sexuality. When she died, I'm sure he was very upset and went on to marry someone who would fit her role. Most all of his victims were older women as well. And then we touch on the subject of these several head injuries. Had he been born in this day and age, where people often go and get help for these kinds of issues and are prescribed medications to help with the psychosis, do you think he might have led a more normal life? Do you think he could have become a functioning member of society? Tell me guys, what do you think? Leave me a comment below or you can DM me on Instagram at serial underscore killing. All of my contact information is below. And thank you so much for watching guys. I appreciate you so much. Have a great day.